All right, lesson 39, more factoring, another method called difference of two squares and using that to solve equations, and then special parallelograms or a rhombus and properties of that. So first thing is a formula for you guys to write down in your notes and learn, and that's going to be the difference of squares formula. That means you have two terms, not three or four, and you have a minus sign between them. So one, two terms and a minus sign. Then the other thing about those, the terms are what we call perfect squares. When we have that, we take, if we started off with an x squared, we put an x, we take the square root of that first term. If we had a minus uh, 9, 9 is a perfect square, we'd have a 3 and a 3, but notice we have one plus sign and one minus sign in those parentheses. Sort of remember seeing that last year in Algebra 1. Hope so. We're going to do several examples where we practice using that. Oh, what happened to that next slide? Okay, maybe some that was interesting. Oh. All right, so let's try that formula out. How many terms? Everybody in class, hold up fingers. How many terms? So we've got two. Is there a minus sign between them? Is x squared something that we can take the square root of? Very easily. So we know we're going to have two parentheses that both start with x. One with a plus, one with a minus. Can we take a square root of 25? Everybody in class, shout that out. So that's going to factor as plus 5 and minus 5. So that's e that much is easy enough. Let's do one that's a little bit more of a challenge then. This time we want to solve by factoring and notice it is equal to 0. So just like what we were talking about in the previous lesson, now we want to try to factor that. So how many terms do we have? 2. Do we have a plus or a minus sign between? We have a minus. Do we always start off with, oh, let's do parentheses, or what do we look for first? We're going to look for a common factor. Anybody see a common factor there? Shout it out if you do. So, there's not an S in both of them, but there is a 12 in both of them. So let's see what happens there, because that's what jumps out at me too. So 12. And then that's going to leave me 12s squared minus 3. I don't know the square root of 12 or the square root of 3. But if I tried to factor just 12s squared minus 3, what do we always start with? We look for the GCF. Is there a GCF of 12 and 3? So let's pull that out, so we'll keep the 12, but let's also pull a 3 out, which leaves us 4s squared minus 1. And I do want to see the equal zeros as you go down through these. So I'm really looking at 36 was really my GCF. I just am not very good with my 36 multiplication facts, so I didn't see it at first. So it's okay to pull out what you see as a GCF. But then look again, is there anything more that we missed? All right, two terms then. 4s squared and a minus 1. Can we take a square root of 4s squared? Shout it out if you're in class. So 2s, start both parentheses with 2s. We want a plus and a minus. Can we take a square root of 1? Sure enough, so 1 and 1 and that equals zero. 
So then 36 can't ever be equal to zero, so that one doesn't do anything. 2s plus 1 could be equal to 0, so 2s could be minus 1, and 2s could be plus 1. Divide both sides by 2, s could be minus a half, and s could be plus a half for those two answers. So same as what we did before, solve, we make it equal 0, we see if we can factor, we just use our difference of squares formula. Okay, one last one, and then we'll move on to the rhombus stuff. So how many terms? Two, plus or minus sign between them? Minus. Um, is there a GCF? No, so I want everybody at home and in class Write down what you think these two parentheses might be. At home, type it in the chat, but wait to hit enter. So can you take a square root of 121m squared? Can you take a square root of 64 to get the two things that go in those parentheses? Okay, folks at home, hit enter. What are our parentheses? Excellent. Square root of 121 is 11. Square root of m squared is m. So we start both parentheses with 11m. Square root of 64 is an 8. One of those has a plus, one a minus. Does not matter which one you write first. If 11m minus 8 is 0, that means 11m is 8. If 11m plus 8 is 0, that means 11m is minus 8. Divide both sides by 11. And m is positive or negative. 8. Okay, we'll try that again. Positive or negative 8 over 11. Sorry, this stylus isn't a little bit better. So we're very good with difference of squares and factoring. Okay, quick summary. Whenever you have something that you are factoring, always, 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 always look for GCF first. If you have two terms, is there a minus sign? Because if there's a plus sign, you cannot factor two terms. If there wasn't a GCF, there's nothing else you can do. If you have three terms, like we saw in the previous lesson, if it starts with 1x squared, you want to factor it as x and x, starting the each of the two parentheses. If it's not one, you're going to use the AC method. And if there are four terms, then you try factoring by grouping. So that should all be or just a review summary of things that you already know there. All right, moving on to properties of a quadrilateral or of a parallelogram, because we're going to talk about rhombuses that are a special kind of parallelogram. So we were reviewing while we waited for the previous video to finish uploading. Uh, we remember that in any parallelogram, the definition is top and bottom are parallel and left and right are parallel. Other properties are that the opposite angles are congruent. The adjacent angles are supplementary, so two angles right beside each other as we go around the parallelogram will add up to 180. Another property, which I haven't drawn in on this quadrilateral yet, if I draw the two, sorry, control here. If I draw in the two diagonals, they will bisect. Oops, that's not what I wanted to have happen. Change the selector tool on me. If I draw in the two diagonals, they will cut each other in half. So those two pieces will be congruent, and these two pieces will be congruent. And in addition, the opposite sides are also congruent. So a rhombus, then, is 
a parallelogram with four congruent sides. So it's still a parallelogram. So the left and the right are parallel, the top and the bottom are parallel. But in addition, all four sides are congruent. I thought I had a picture in here. All right, we're on the next one. So a rhombus is going to be a parallelogram, so the top and the bottom. are going to be parallel, the left and the right are parallel, but all four sides also have the same measure. So you see how those are all marked as congruent. I don't worry about these numbers. Another thing about a rhombus, the diagonals, we know because it's a parallelogram, they bisect each other, but they also bisect the angles. So I've got these two diagonals drawn in there, and you see here at D, it has split that into two equal pieces. Same thing at A, B, and C. It splits each of those angles into two equal pieces. And one final extra property, just because something is a rhombus, the diagonals bisect each other, they bisect the angles, and when it's a rhombus, they make a right angle with each other when they do that. They are perpendicular bisectors. So they cross at 90 degrees. Very, very good with that. All right, so you're going to start seeing some problems that look something like this. They may give you different information on different ones. This is a rhombus. So all those things about parallelograms and those three extra things about a rhombus are all true here. So we're going to use those seven things to be able to solve whatever we need to find here in this particular figure. New definition for you guys is a reflex angle. So that means not the angle on the inside of the rhombus, but if we start here and go all the way around like that, that is 306 degrees. So that's a new definition. If we go around on the outside, that's our reflex angle. Now we want to find X, A, B, and Z. It is a rhombus. So right off the bat, how big is Z? Z is 90 right off the bat because it is a rhombus. And the reason for that is diagonals of a rhombus are perpendicular. And that upside down T, I'm drawing those so they look like they make a right angle. That's the symbol for perpendicular. So I went ahead and got Z. Okay, tell me something about X and B. Type it in the chat if you can tell me something about X and B. Those are those two angles on either side of this diagonal down here. Type it in the chat if you can tell me something about X and B. They are congruent angles. That was one of the special properties of a rhombus, that the diagonals bisect the angles. So we can say that X equals B, because in a rhombus, the diagonals bisect, and we have to say the angles, not just each other. Okay, do we know how big X plus B would have to be, or can we figure it out? Okay, 
Okay, I got typed in the chat that x plus b plus 306 would have to be 360 because that would have made not just this red part, but that would have finished the circle. So we call that circle sum. But we know x and b are the same as each other. So that means 2x. And if I subtract 306 from both sides, what do I have left? 54? Divide both sides by 2. Sophia, what's half of 54? Can you help me out with that one? So it would be 27, and that means B would also be 27. Okay, now I need to come up with A. I wonder how I'm going to do that. A is this one right here. So type it in the chat if you've got an idea. Oh. That would be one way that we could do that. We could say this is also A right here because diagonals bisect the angles. And then we could say these two angles are supplementary because they're adjacent. There are other ways we could have set that up as well. So we could say that 54, because we know that's what X plus B is from right here, plus 2A would have to be 180. So that was a combination of diagonals, bisect angles, and adjacent angles, are supplementary. So subtract 50. So you guys go ahead and finish that one. Subtract 54 from both sides. So 2A is something. Divide both sides by 2. And we'll have what A is. Type it in the chat, but wait to hit enter. Those in the classroom, raise your hands when you have a value for A. Have you stopped writing? Does that mean you have an answer? Or are you still thinking? Okay, all at the same time, I am going to have everybody in class and everybody on the chat shout it out or hit enter. So go ahead, shout it out, hit enter. So 63, I'm seeing on the chat screen as well. So it looks like we did pretty darn good with that. Anybody with questions on any of that? All right, we're going to take a quick break. Um, those of you at home, stay logged in. We're going to then switch over and do homework checking, um, things that we need to talk about with all homework. Um, I think we're checking 35 and 36. I think you got up through 34 with Mr. Adams. Um, if you're at home and you need to go take a quick bathroom break or get a, grab a snack real fast, if you're in here, one at a time, we can, you know, go take a bathroom break as time allows, or you can just stand up and stretch. If you don't need to do any of that, go ahead and start on um, 38, um, the first problem or two, so you're making good use of your time. 